Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this month's youth podcast. Today's uh, podcast will be inshallah about the treatment of women in Islam and today uh, I'm joined by brother Abdul Hasib, regular uh, namazi at Handel Jamia Masjid as well as brother Ali and we have a very special guest alhamdulillah this month. Uh, he was raised in New York uh, however he now lives in uh, Florida. He's a uh, you know frequently talks a lot about you know islam in the u.s and about civil rights and does a lot of things and that is sheikh hassan shibli sheikh thank you very much for joining us it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast so thank you very much for being here alhamdulillah it's an honor to be with all of you mashallah my brothers so you know we'd like to start the podcast of you so today's topic is about the treatment of women uh, in islam what would you say about the treatment how they are treated today in islamic society you know the fact of the matter is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this life as a test for us and he has ordered ihsan in all that we do that we engage with each other recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us he hears us he sees all that we do and ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran we made some of you as test for others will you have patience Um, how we treat each other uh, ultimately uh, will determine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats us. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, it is stated in the hadith, la yarhamullah man la yarhaman nas, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not have mercy on those who don't have mercy to people. Uh, whoever is harsh with people, Allah may be harsh with them. Whoever doesn't forgive people, Allah will not forgive them. So ultimately, whether it's women, children, or our fellow brothers, how we treat each other is uh, ultimately uh, part of our test. Right? And it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains ihsan that we excel in how we treat others. When we look at the kind of environment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants Muslims to build, Allah described it very beautifully. الغيب, those who control their anger. الناس, those who forgive others. Allah loves those who go above and beyond, who don't just merely try to strive for justice, but who try to strive for ihsan, having the best conduct and the character in all uh, that they do. So, you know, I think it, in particular, the treatment of women, it's, it's a very uh, interesting subject. Uh, the, uh, I think humanity as a whole sometimes struggles with that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a universal problem. Uh, and I think men factually are often far stronger. Um, and as a result, there's much more responsibility. You know, Islam teaches, and, and being that we're a group of men right now speaking with each other, I think it's very important to talk about what we can do. Uh, we have been given the responsibility to ensure the women in our lives, be they our mothers, our spouses, our children, are treated with the utmost respect and care and love and protection and honor and dignity. And we are to use our strength to ensure that happens. You know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught that the strong person isn't the one who can defeat his enemy. The strong person is the one who can control his anger. The strong person is the one who can uh, uphold justice who can engage in ihsan and how he treats uh, others. So ultimately, I think men have been given the burden and the responsibility to ensure the best treatment for the women in their lives and along with their safety and their security. You know, I mean, and this is something that I think is often forgotten. You know, when it, when it comes to um, even safety and security, the men in the family can and should be willing to lay down their lives to protect the women in their household. 100%, yeah. You know, it's, it's a tremendous responsibility. You know, I'd like to agree with that because, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ came, it was a blessing for us because as an ummah, he got rid of all of the fasad, the corruption, all of the jahiliya. For example, you know, in the times where they would bury their children, the Sahaba, you know, Umar radiallahu an, there's, he says to the Sahaba, it's a narration, we all know it because he says, when I was, I was in jahiliya, I was, uh, my daughter, she was young, and then he took her, to where they would bury her and then he, he was burying her and when the sand when he was digging the grave when the sand would come to his beard he would remove the sand from that beard and you know Umar when he was uh, when he was saying it we, he, he said it with he, he was tears came into his eyes but then after he said alhamdulillah that the Prophet came because this is a blessing because he got rid of all of this jahiliya and then rather what would they say they would say Ya Allah they would beg Allah give us one more daughter because there's a narration that says if you have two or three daughters you you will go to Jannah because of the upbringing that you bring to so these daughters and they would beg Allah for another daughter they would beg Allah for another child 
and these were the Sahaba, you know. Not only this, but Islam was the first ever religion to bring uh, women to have equal rights, you know. You know, of course, now you have women going on rallies trying to get their equal rights, but Islam was the first ever religion to bring that and to actually show the the Islamic rights or like the human rights for the women because you see um, 1918 the whole movement started for in, for example in England they wanted uh, the w women wanted the right to vote they wanted to be equal they want equal pay and whatnot but in Islam we were the first religion to bring that you know we we were the ones where the Prophet ﷺ came he would treat his wives he had so many wives and he would all treat them with the same amount of respect there wouldn't be one wife where he didn't give he, he, he would, there wouldn't be one wife where he gave more respect to the other but rather he treated them with the same amount of respect and the same amount of love this was our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this was our this is the teachings of islam and you should always give like the hadith where it says in al jannah you know i believe it's a, is it in quran or hadith no, it's, in hadith. it's a hadith isn't it you see the hadith says um the jannah is under the feet of the mother you know we should respect our mothers we should give our love to them because when we were kids yeah we didn't understand they would help us they would guide us you know they are they are better than our teachers that we find in schools because they guide us in our everyday lives we will only have a teacher for one year and then we get another teacher they're not going to be there for the rest of our lives but who will be there for the rest of our lives our parents will be there that's why our mothers you know we should always give them the most respect and in the Quran it says وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍّ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا meaning don't even say uff don't even say or if your mom says oh can you please get me water be the first one to go if you if she has so many children be the first one to go and get her water because you don't want to be you don't want to be the one you want to have that competition between your siblings because on the day of judgment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accounts for you he won't he will be looking at you and how you treated your mothers because our mothers are the ones that guide us to Jannah so yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean it's amazing you brought up a lot of great points and that is if you look at the ahadith that relate to us as men all right um, they define what our relationships must be and the responsibilities we have towards the woman in our life. And I think, by the way, this is a very important point. We live in a time when everybody wants to talk about our rights, our rights, our rights. And what's dangerous when someone just focuses exclusively on their rights but forgets to talk about the responsibilities is it creates a very lopsided situation which can lead to actually a lot of destruction. So I really respect and appreciate that as men, we're sitting here and having this conversation about yeah. what are our responsibilities. Yeah towards the woman in our life. And you've pointed out so many beautiful hadith. I mean, look at who are the women in our life. It may be our mother. And then you mentioned the hadith. Paradise is under the feet of the mother. Yeah. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked, to whom should one show the utmost respect and honor? He said, your mother, then your mother, then your mother, then your mother, and then your father. So we see the tremendous honor. In one tradition, uh, one, one of the uh, companions or tabi'in had actually carried his mother on his back to perform uh, hajj. Subhanallah. Imagine that. Man, I'm telling you, you know, even now as youth, if we were to go for Hajj or Umrah, yeah. we will be dead, tired, exhausted, <laughs> yeah, even yeah. without carrying anybody. Imagine yeah. carrying his mom. And he asked, hey, did I pay her back for the goodness that she has shown me? And the answer was, you did not even pay her back for just one uh, instant of pain, one moment of pain that she faced while she was in labor, giving you birth, bringing you this life. And I think, especially as younger brothers, you really do not understand the sacrifice mothers make for their children until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with your own children. And you see that maybe for eight, nine months, maybe the pregnant woman is unable to sleep comfortably, is unable to eat, is constantly throwing up. It's not for a day or two. Imagine, you know, I, sometimes you drive in a car and you feel a little nauseous. For 15, 20 minutes, you feel like you're gonna throw up. You can't wait to get out of the car. You feel sick, you feel tired. Yeah. There's women who face that for months as they're, preparing to give birth and then the, the pain of labor and then once the baby is born the baby needs to feed every two hours every two hours 24 hours a day the mother has to drop whatever she's doing to nourish the child again you could forget sleep you can forget rest so much sacrifice and this is why we can never ever pay back our mothers and we live in a society and culture you know, that really disrespects parents. I mean, the whole concept of having homes for elder people yeah. because people don't want to take care of their parents. They don't visit their parents. And you visit in the West, you know, grandparents and, and uh, elderly parents. And, and when was the last time they heard from their children? They haven't heard from them. There's no more respect. So I think as young men, it's very important to remember the rights of the parents of the Prophet said. Then when you get married, the Prophet Muhammad said, 
you know, khayrukum khayrukum li ahli. The best of you are those that are best of their spouses. And this is a very important lesson because it's, again, it's easy to show respect to your fellow brothers. It's easy to show respect to those that you consider uh, equal to you in strength, yeah. for example. But when you show strength and res when you show respect and mercy and love and compassion and patience and tolerance and kindness to somebody that maybe is in a weaker position. I mean, your wife not sleeping, not being able to even take care of herself and you're there to support her as she just gave birth. That's a sign of true strength. And it, it can be a struggle. So again, being the best to your spouse. Then daughters, you mentioned the beautiful hadith about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that whoever has three daughters, in another tradition, two daughters, and even people said maybe if even it was asked about one, he would say the same, Allahu Alam. Whoever has daughters and raises them properly and honors them. And this is a huge thing because in that society, they were literally burying their daughters alive. You know, will be guaranteed paradise by virtue of raising uh, his daughters. So whatever woman we have in our life, be they our mothers, our spouses, our children, Islam taught us that the way to paradise is by honoring them, is by respecting them, is by elevating them, is by protecting them. At the same time, Islam does teach women as well that they have roles and responsibilities as well, not just rights. Because again, the problem happens, you know, a lot of times you hear this where a woman says, you know, the Prophet said did this, this and that to her husband. You know, he kind of, he always used to help his family, you know, and you're not helping me. You're, you're not like the Prophet. You know, I want a divorce. Subhanallah. And the families break down. Yeah. So it's very dangerous whenever a side just wants to learn about their rights. If our conversation was just about the rights of men, how destructive would that be? Because we can list all the hadith men. Uh, fathers have tremendous rights. Husbands have tremendous rights. You know, so imagine we're going to go through the list and just as men talk about the rights of men and then we can point out how some women may not meet those rights and then it can lead to a toxic negative environment. No, I think what's healthy for us as men is we talk about our responsibilities to women and for women that they also study and learn their responsibilities to the men in their life. And when each side is focusing on the responsibilities, they will inevitably then fulfill the rights the other has. And when they fulfill the rights of the other, they build a happy, harmonious, successful relationship. Otherwise, I think in modern liberal secular feminist thought, where it just focuses exclusively on the rights to the exclusion of responsibilities, this is why you have these, uh, you know, uh, very high rates of divorce and, and problems. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So, uh, I agree with you, but a lot of it comes from so upbringing or lack of education. Because mm. we don't have a lot of education, mm. and especially when it comes to upbringing, we're brought up, say, so when we're, so we're brought up in like families and stuff, and they might not treat their daughters equally, their sons equally, but this is a huge culture problem. When culture comes into religion, they might say, like, a lot of the subconscious, but they want more sons than daughters because of all of this. And then it also comes to education. So we're not, we're not teaching enough how to, the rights of women and stuff, which is, increasing the level of divorces and stuff that no, that's a great a, point unfortunately there are times within cultures and it's not just yeah. you, you know one particular culture that yeah. you mentioned i mean look at the culture in the u.s of how women are treated how often is a woman in the united states raped or yeah. facing domestic violence or or even uh, a murder horrible things you know so mistreatment of women is a universal problem and it's because i believe their men are naturally physically stronger and without truly studying faith and spirituality and character, then they don't learn how to use that strength as a responsibility for the protection of women within their life. Yeah. And then they fall into the major disrespect of, of dishonor, mm -hmm. of harming even. These are serious problems. And that comes not from strength, but from weakness. Because a strong man, a true man, would never intentionally harm anyone within their life, especially not somebody that they're commanded and entrusted to protect. You know, and that Quran is very clear. You know, men are maintainers of women. That's not a thing of power or position or like a leg up that it's something. No, that's a responsibility. That is a burden that they are entrusted to be, take care of the woman within their lives. And as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said again, the best of you are the best of their spouses. Another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very clearly uh, never ever struck a woman or a child. You know, you, you have even whether it's uh, boys or girls now, you have parents that unfortunately physically abuse their children. Yeah. That was not the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I think that's also a reflection of weakness. A true teacher teaches through love, through compassion, through mercy. Never, I think, resorts to, to physical violence or anything like that. That only reflects weakness. That's a huge problem nowadays as well, physical violence. Because yeah. treatment of women, but men, it's about lowering your gaze, treating you like your sister. 
outside, but sometimes the men they have more desires to come in and start kicking in. So it's a bit difficult for them. That's what you know, Islam responds with that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's take for example the hijab, you know society plays a big role in this because you know they say uh, a woman is oppressed for wearing the hijab you find that a lot or on social media um, a, a woman would put a picture of her with a hijab they say oh she's oppressed but no but why what's the real reason for wearing the hijab the reason for wearing the hijab is to protect the aura of a woman so then men don't let their desires get the better of them so when they look at the woman they lower their gaze because it is to protect the woman herself so then after she doesn't get um abused in a in a in a manner that could be harming to her or like as you said um women in nowadays can get like raped or um sexually touched you know we don't the islam would the aura is protected it the hijab protects them from these such sort of events because it's the protection of the beauty and you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not only like I think the meaning of the hijab has been lost in our nowadays society you know and w one of the responses to that of course is no matter what a woman dresses and wears uh, the man is responsible for his self-control yeah. and his yeah. treating her with honor and respect it doesn't matter whether a woman is wearing a hijab or a mini skirt that yeah. does not give a license for abuse for disrespect everybody's responsible for themselves mm -hmm. but when it comes to hijab and modest dress, which, by the way, modest dress is commanded for men and for women. Uh, it is to give us honor. You look at Adam and his wife, uh, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon them. They were in Jannah. The effect of engaging in sin was that they lost their clothes. You know, so immodesty, inappropriate dress, that is the result of sin. And unfortunately, uh, because it, it goes against the honor and the human dignity. So Islam to preserve honor and dignity for both men and women has commanded uh, modest dress. In particular, for women as well, hijab, dressing modest, uh, modestly, keeping their beauty uh, personally for those that are worthy of enjoying it. But nonetheless, the responsibility for just treatment is there regardless of, of how the dress is. But it's about honor. And unfortunately, let's be frank, we cannot let uh, Islam's values, the, the values of Islamic teachings, be subjected to modern, Western, liberal, secular thought. Because no matter what, they will never be happy with it. They won't, and they themselves are miserable. You know, they don't have the solution. Why are they our standard? Our standard is not what is accepted within the norms of society. In fact, if we are fitting into the norms of society, we're failing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you obey most of who's on the earth, they will misguide you from the path of Allah. And the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in how miserable they themselves are. They're not finding happiness through all this nudity, yeah. right? They're feeling used and abused. Uh -huh. They're not finding happiness through all the promiscuity. They're not finding happiness through all, uh, all the homosexuality. All these things that are being promoted as solutions today are really just sources of more misery and pain and sadness. For us, we know we have a creator and our creator, he establishes our moral compass. And through fi following that moral compass, we will find peace in this life and in the next. Allah bi and we move only in the remembrance of Allah through hearts find tranquility. But the real the question for us is how do we calibrate our moral compass? What determines morality? For us as Muslims, we believe it's our creator. Uh, for others, it's their own desires, and their desires only betray them. Mm -hmm. So, Sheikh, obviously, a lot of you have mentioned that Islam, we were the first ones to give women the actual right, you know, we got to give women the actual right, you know, we got them into education. A lot before the West, you know, mm -hmm. um, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam introduced this before. However, now what is, is the West think that we Muslims oppress the woman? And how, what do you think we should do as modern Muslims to miss... Uh, to miss you, you know, this is a big misconception. What can we do to, you know, clear it? Look, I don't think we need to clear anything to anyone, quite frankly. Okay. We don't need to impress anyone. Yeah. We really don't. We need to be grateful for what we got. And we need to practice Islam in the best of ways, not to impress anyone, but to impress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to please Allah subhanahu okay. wa ta'ala. And when we do that, the people will be yeah. impressed with us. Very true. You know, uh, there's a saying that whoever uh, displeases Allah, to, to please people, Allah will be displeased with him and he will make people displeased with him. Right. But whoever 
works to please Allah and doesn't care what people think, Allah will be pleased with him and yeah. people please with him. So look, to be frank, for the sake of Allah, we do want to call people to Islam. Yeah. We do want to engage in da'wah. Yeah. We do want them to find guidance. But it will not be by just going with their arguments, trying to counter every argument of theirs. Because there's some things they will never be happy with. I mean, let's look at niqab, for example. Niqab is a proper Islamic practice. Yeah. And honestly, a lot in the West will not accept it. And that's fine. We don't need to sell. We don't need to compromise. Uh -huh. But those who've lived their life, I mean, I know women who live the Miami lifestyle, right? Mini skirts and parties and clubs, and they, they feel disgusted by that lifestyle. They exchange that for hijab and niqab and modesty. I mean, my wife is an example of that, walhamdulillah. You know, so those who are sincere, they will see the beauty in our deen. So what we need to do is practice Islam in the best of ways, you know, and translate that practice into having the best of character. We can go through the proofs. Look, yes, Islam gave women the right to inherit, you know, over a thousand years before the West did. Yeah. Islam gave women the right to choose into divorce or to uh, choose into marriage or even to seek divorce, you know, a thousand years before the West did. I mean, and most of the rights that are offered in the West, the Islamic civilization offered for women over a thousand years before. But I don't think that's relevant. What's relevant is, do we practice our deen? Do we practice it in the best of ways and let that be a shining example? And whoever is pleased, alhamdulillah, and whoever isn't pleased, then they can uh, just قُلْ مُوتُوا بِغَيْبِكُمْ You know, uh, your loss. We're, you know, we're not a football team trying to recruit the best players. We got what we need. You know what I'm saying? So let's just keep practicing. You know, treat your mother in the best of ways and let your neighbors, let society, let community see that. Treat the women in your li lives, your, your, your sisters, your daughters, when you get married, your spouses. Treat them in the best of ways. And to be honest, look, they will still try to defame you. I mean, uh, frankly, the stereotypes that Islam is, is oppressive towards women, that's a stereotype that's used to attack Muslim men all the time, whether it's true or not. I myself have faced it. You know, when you make political enemies, they want to fabricate things despite what the evidence says. They'll never be pleased. As long as we ourselves do right, then those who matter, they'll see through it. Yeah, it's like you don't need to please the creation, but rather you need to please the creator. Mm, that's because it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Eventually, mm. what's this dunya? What mm. maximum 100 years? Then we're going to return to At Allah most. subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. We came from earth and we're going to go back into the earth. And then when we get resurrected, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask, What did we do with our time on the earth? And then after you'd find those that will just say that, for example, the Western, they try to bring hate towards Islam you know they try to give so much hate to Islam and I'll tell you this and from from what I believe you know if any other religion was attacked the way Islam was attacked it would have crumbled mm. already mm. but rather Islam stays strong because we don't need to please the creation because we please the creator we don't need to look left and right to see um, uh, people saying oh look at these lot no we only want to say it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in the eyes of Allah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, uh, like he says to Angel Jibreel, if he's pleased with someone, he'll say, I love this person. And then after Angel Jibreel will say to all the angels, and then eventually all of the heavens will like this person. And then after that's the beauty that we should achieve. We don't need to please someone that's just uh, going to um, give hate to, towards us or try to make us feel down about our religion. But rather we should be... A, impressed by a religion because of what it stands for mm. yeah, very true. Mm. so you know there's a lot we can learn from the quran about how to treat women there's a whole surah in the quran a uh, surah al-nisa which treats us uh, which shows us how to treat the woman and also uh, as men you know we can learn from other surahs for example surah yusuf when you know the wife of the al-aziz tried to uh, you know seduce the prophet yusuf alayhi salam how the prophet had sabr not only sabr but had sabr and jameel beautiful patience and you know as men there's a lot we can learn from that and so it's important that we read the quran as long as uh, as well as reading the quran read the tafsir of it and that's how you you know really get the education which will help you in this life immensely you know and islam is balanced yeah. you know and the problem is now you know there was oppression of women that's imbalanced then there's movements to counter that like me too and hashtag believer which is also imbalanced mm -hmm. you know you look at if yeah. if we were to go with the me too hashtag believe her then everybody would have believed Zulaikha. She yeah. falsely mm -hmm. accused yeah. a messenger of Allah of raping her. But even her own people were principled. They went with evidence. Yeah. They said if the shirt is ripped in the front, then okay, yeah. he's guilty. If it's from the back, he's innocent. And subhanAllah, it was proven he was innocent. But still, because of the politics, he still ended up in jail. Yeah. He was a messenger of Allah. 
falsely accused of rape, ended up years in jail. And when he was in jail, how was he described by his companions? Imagine this, man, because we face some tests and we crumble. We could, here's a messenger of Allah being uh, accused of the worst of things and then thrown in jail. Very difficult situation. And his companions said, Inna minal muhsineen. We see you of those who excel in goodness. Then he was liberated and he became the treasurer of the land. And he was in a position of nobility and respect. How was he described? We see you as those who excel in good. Yusuf was a beautiful example. Whether he was at the bottom or he was at the top, he was still remained of the Muhsineen. He didn't allow the tough times to corrupt him. He didn't allow the good times to corrupt him. And it's a very important message. Remember, we have to see everything from the lens of being a test for us. Allah yeah. testing us. And I'll finish with this very quickly. Is, you know, the hadith talks about obeying and honoring the parents. Even if your parents do you wrong. And that's, that's a test. Look, of course, that's a whole separate talk. The responsibility of parents to raise children in the right way. But if our parents do us wrong, does that entitle us to show them disrespect? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. You know, and the, the truth of the matter is you may have a situation where your own wife disrespects you, treats you wrong. Does that allow you to express your anger in the wrong way? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. These are all tests for us. We can't just, you know, uh, have this false... Uh, you know, uh, f a false reality that we build of, oh, Islam talks about we have to treat women good and therefore everything is perfect. No, there's real tests that we will face. But that's the point. These are tests for Allah to see what kind of people are we, what kind of character do we have. We always have to strive to treat others with ihsan, with kindness. And if we fall short of that, we do what needs to be done to fix it. Whether that means holding ourselves accountable, whether that means getting therapy, marital counseling, which I think is essential. I recommend, especially for all young people, invest in marital counseling and therapy. You know, uh, whatever it is that we continue to improve, we should make a goal never to get in an argument with our spouse. And if we get in an argument, never to raise our voices and never to curse. You know, we need to strive for ihsan. And if we fall short, we do whatever we need to do to improve. It's a continuous learning struggle. So coming back to it's all about like what he said saying it's about patience because mm. if you don't have the patience you wouldn't be able to do anything what you just right. said because anger takes over the whole body mm. and once you're angry you don't know what you're doing mm. that's why they say anger is haram because you, when you're angry you don't know what you're doing you might say a couple of words because you could say sorry which is easy but the words will always stay the, the damage person. is done yeah the damage is done so if you say example something to your spouse and you say sorry she might but in her heart, she would always remember yes. you said something. The damage is done. That's it. That's what it is. This is why the Prophet ﷺ was asked about advice. He said, لا تغضب. Don't get angry. Yeah. Again, okay, uh, uh, give me advice. لا تغضب. Don't get angry. Don't get angry. Four times then, uh, he said, you know, uh, uh, as if your mother didn't give birth to you. Do you not get it? Do not get <laughs> angry. Uh, because anger opens up the door of all I mean, how many people I know, they get in an argument and then the husband triple divorces the wife. You know, or says something that cannot be taken back or even worse, God forbid, things get physical. And it happens both ways, by the way. You know, if you look at the data, uh, you know, about a third of women, they say, are victims of domestic violence. But even about a quarter of men these days are also a victim of domestic violence. So Shaytan is just trying his best to, to uh, create uh, division within the communities and within the societies. And we have to go back to our faith that teaches us discipline, that teaches us control and ihsan. It isn't about avoiding the wrong action, but it's about really treasuring our uh, the women in our life, making them feel appreciated, honored, respected, loved, and really sacrificing. A man has to really sacrifice for those around him and lead through that kind of example. Sure. And what do you do? Like, because a lot of people can't control the anger, mm. and they say something. What would you recommend or advise people to do when they get angry? something so it doesn't happen and they can stay away from these things you know it's all very specific and depends on the individuals yeah. and the couples and that's why i always recommend people get counseling people get therapy um but you know some very simple things you know there was there was a, a story they say that uh, uh, a husband and wife kept fighting so the wife went and wanted to get advice from a sheikh so he gave her some some water he said it's holy water he said when your husband gets home drink this water but don't swallow it it's very strong you know uh, then after an hour, he comes home, spit it out, but don't swallow it. It's very strong. So she comes back a week later. How's everything? Oh, everything is great. You know, what was in the water? He said it was nothing. It's just when you <laughs> drank the water and then spit it out, you didn't engage in a back and forth. You know, you controlled your tongue. Yeah. The idea is, look, if you uh, maybe because these things happen, we can't pretend they don't. Yeah, yeah. If you come home and there's a dispute, there's an argument. And the worst thing, by the way, it's funny because in all the podcasts you see, you know, if a husband comes home tired, the first thing the wife should do is not, she should not be complaining about something yeah, negative because the husband comes home tired and that it still happens. It happens. But we have to learn. We cannot control other people's actions. 
we cannot control other people's actions. We can only control our own. So if somebody says words to us, whether it's our spouse, whether it's our sibling, whether it's our friend, that really upsets us, just walk away. Simple. Walk away. Take time. Let things cool down. You know, the Prophet said, advised making wudu. You know, if you're standing, sitting, if you're sitting, lying down. But even sometimes, you just got to walk away. Let things cool down. Go for a walk. Uh, do some dhikr. Do some ibadah. Do not engage. Shaitan loves argumentation and disputes. Don't allow the shaitan to promote that. So even my, my own spouse and I, we, we, we have this agreement that if one of us is upset and we feel like we're going to get into an argument, we'll just take a little break, go for a little walk, and come back and talk about it in, in, in a correct way. Yeah, that's the best. You know, I think mm. Islam teaches morals. Mm. As in, it teaches you, if you open the Quran, yes, you've got stories, but most of the Quran is about morals. It teaches you how to live your everyday lives, how to treat others, how to treat the people around you, how to treat your women, like your wives, your sisters, your mothers, or whoever it may be. It teaches you how, the respect because you find it in like, of course, in uh, the whole of our deen was compiled like in that within the hadith, within the Quran. You find that if if we treat our wives and we treat them with respect, we will be able to attain the rewards of the akhirah because we treat them with the love, we treat them how we would want to be treated. Don't treat others like if if I was, for example, if I don't want to be shouted at, yeah, then after why am I shouting at someone else? Mm. Don't don't treat someone how if you don't want to be treated that treat way. Treat people like you want to be treated. Exactly. And, but remember one thing that will not guarantee you success in this life. It does guarantee you success in the hereafter. You know, sometimes you can do all the right things yeah. and you can still face very difficult situations. And those are our tests. That's and it's okay. That's start giving up. That's yeah. when people give up. I did all the right things and they yeah. still falsely accuse me. Yeah. They still mock me. They still attack me. Alhamdulillah, we're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah tests the best of them. That's it. Allah mm -hmm. Allah. Because he only tests the ones with the mm. strongest in man. Mm. This mm. is what, if, if you get tested by Allah, don't, don't look at it as a negative, but rather look at it as a positive. It's a beautiful thing. It's something you celebrate. And you see the sacrifice the Sahaba and the Anbiya had to go through for us to learn these lessons. I mean, look at وَمْرَأَةَ نُوحٍ وَمْرَأَةَ لُوْتِ you know, كانت تحت عبدين من عبادنا صالحين فخانتاهما فلم يغني عنهما من الله شيء وقيل ادخل النار مع الداخلين. You know, Nuh عليه السلام, a messenger of Allah, Lut عليه السلام, a messenger of Allah, great people who I'm sure treated their spouses with the utmost honor and respect. Yet that didn't translate into their spouses treating them in the same way. In fact, they betrayed them, they hurt them, and ultimately they weren't of those who were, uh, you know, saved. So ultimately, we're responsible for our actions. That's the number one rule you have to do. You cannot control what somebody else does. You can advise, yeah. you can teach, you know, in a beautiful way. But this is where also people get angry, by the way. When they try, they want to force somebody to act or behave in a certain way. You can't control anybody. You give the advice, but you can absolutely control what you do and how you react. And you should only act and react in a way where you remember, Allah sees me, or Allah hears me, Allah is with me. How do I want Allah to treat me? If they are, uh, if they are right and I'm in the wrong, then I should be course humble but even if they're in the wrong and i'm in the right how many times in my life is allah in the right it's every time and i'm in the wrong yeah. you know still do i want allah to be harsh with me or do i want him to be gentle and yeah. forgiving yeah. so treat others as you want allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to treat yeah. you that's really the best advice don't treat others how you want them to treat you or 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 treat them how they treat you it'll be it'll never end treat them how you want allah to treat you and also understand yourself if you're in a situation that's unhealthy get therapy get counseling if you're in a heated moment, walk away. But never ever allow your actions or your words to be something that doesn't please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're failing in that, do whatever you need to do to improve. Yeah, I think uh, the Sheikhs emphasize a lot on counseling and that's very important, especially for couples. And that's a service that is available at Hamdur Jamia Masjid. So, you know, any couples or anyone who want to go that, just uh, feel free to go to the Masjid and ask the Imam or, you know, someone for that. Uh, so, you know, uh, feed time by Sheikh, would you like to give any last piece of advice? No, so, Alhamdulillah, just all, all, keep us in your du'as and it's so beautiful to see some youth mm -hmm. that are gathering together to talk about how they can grow. And ultimately, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq to live our life, you know, uh, with the reality, with uh, reflecting the reality that it is short and that Allah is with us and that we always engage in ihsan and we continue to improve until we meet Allah and He's pleased with us. Amen. Jazakallah, Shaykh, for joining us for this month's podcast. We're very grateful to have you and inshallah we will do another episode with you soon, inshallah. Jazakallah. Jazakallah.